Welcome. I'm Air Commodore Finn Monaghan, Head of Doctrine, Air, Space and Cyber at the Development, Concepts and Doctrine Centre at Shrivenham. I'm very pleased to release Joint Doctrine Note 2-20, Threat Finance and Economic Levers of Power, in this audiobook format. I'm most grateful to Officer Cadet Erin Geraghty from Cambridge University Air Squadron, who reads the main part of the document. I'm also very grateful to the Accessible Doctrine team who have edited this audiobook for you to listen to. Chapter 1 Chapter 1 introduces threat finance and economic levers, the terminology that will be used in this joint doctrine note, and how threat finance and economic levers are applied. A quotation from Daniel L. Glazer, Assistant Secretary for Terrorist Financing and Financial Crimes in the United States Department of the Treasury's Office for Terrorism and Financial Intelligence, May 2011 to January 2017. The international financial system lies at the heart of the global economy. Its smooth and efficient operation is essential to our collective prosperity and development. The international financial system, however, is equally indispensable to those who would do us harm. Terrorist organisations, organised crime groups, rogue regimes and corrupt leaders the world over. Taking strong and effective action to defend the integrity of the international financial system from abuse and to undermine the financial networks that support these nefarious actors, both safeguards both our economies and our national security. There can be no comprehensive response to a national security threat that does not include a strong financial component. Attacking the financial networks that support terrorist organisations is indispensable in the global effort against them and against all forms of violent extremism. Chapter 1 Introduction For centuries from antiquity to the present day, States and non-states have employed the economic instrument of national power against adversaries for purposes of cooperation, competition, confrontation, coercion and conflict. These economic levers encompass sanctions, embargoes and blockades, seeking to debilitate an adversary's economy as well as providing incentives such as funding proxies or buying allegiance by agreeing favourable trade deals. The politics and economics of fear and greed have influenced crises throughout history, from the 1940 to 1941 Japanese response to oil embargoes, to the impacts of the 2008 financial crash on world governments and populations. Economic levers, most often applied to adversaries, can also be applied to help support and encourage allies. Economic levers can be applied overtly and directly by governments through international consensus at the United Nations or via regional and like-minded coalitions such as the European Union or the Gulf Cooperation Council's economic blockade against Qatar. And they can be applied covertly and camouflaged through proxies. Finance is a key consideration for a state's ability to sustain a conflict and defend itself. Finance is also important to groups such as Islamic State, enabling them to operate and perpetuate their ideology and campaign of violence. Providing finance and other resources can significantly enhance non-state actors' capacity, such as the Mujahideen and Irish Republican Army, IRA, to strike at nation states. Finance can be a tool of diplomacy, but it can also be equally used as a tool of security and war. It is this latter category that this Joint Doctrine Note, JDN, aims to address. The formal use of economic warfare by the British has strong links as far back as the Anglo-Dutch Wars of the 1600s, but it has been poorly incorporated into recent doctrine. Instead, since 1945, Economic warfare has been used on a case-by-case basis to match new threats. Economic warfare has been a cornerstone of British maritime strategy until the end of World War II 
But since Britain recasts itself into the North Atlantic Treaty Organisation, NATO, defence's capability and involvement in threat finance and economic levers, TFEL, has ebbed and flowed, with some aspects previously considered by defence now being led by other government departments. Footnote 2. The UK's Ministry of Defence, MOD, has an economic and finance capability, which includes career paths, and the reference here is to actively use threat finance and economic levers, TFEL. Return to main text. Defence has taken a backseat position compared to other government departments on TFEL-related capabilities. In today's rapidly changing and globalised threat environment, the use of economic tools by allies and adversaries requires us to formalise our thinking in this area, to learn from the past but also be forward-looking in new application possibilities. The UK military has used TFEL in several different ways throughout history and there are a number of example case studies in Annex A. It has generated capabilities to deal with historic problem sets and while some of these structures remain, they will need to be improved to ensure an enduring and holistic approach to TFEL along with the resulting career and training strands to support a sustainable function. However, apart from individual elements within defence intelligence, defence fraud and in specialist subject matter expert units, there has not been an overarching headquarters capability. Instead, when a new crisis arises, there has been a tendency to respond after events as opposed to anticipating the crisis in advance. When the Ministry of Defence, MOD, gained the senior responsible officer position in counter-ISIL finance, it stood up a Secretariat in Military Strategic Effects, MSE, in December 2015, when the so-called Islamic State's abusers of the financial systems in Iraq and Syria were already well established. The small cost of an enduring headquarters capability is greatly outweighed by the ability to respond in a more agile way and coordinate extant subject matter experts within defence, either before a crisis occurs or in its inception, rather than when it is in full flow. The role of the military is constantly developing and is increasingly embracing tasks that go beyond traditional military operations. Concepts such as hybrid warfare and multi-domain integration require the military to develop an expanding range of skills and capabilities. This publication argues that an understanding of TFEL is one critical capability that needs to be developed to successfully embrace these expanding responsibilities. Future successful operations will be the result of a planning process that considers the financial aspects of the operating environment, including the potential impact of TFEL, most likely as part of a range of activities, within the appropriate legal framework. This is as relevant in a humanitarian operation as it is in warfighting. Examples include stopping inadvertently funding Hezbollah through use of Lebanese trading houses during Operation Grit Rock in Sierra Leone, or defeating the so-called Daesh Caliphate during Operation Shader. A further example of using TFEL as part of military operations can be seen when Section 15 of the Terrorism Act 2000, Fundraising for Terrorism, and the associated extraterritorial extensions later in the Act, is used to stop foreign terrorist fighters travelling to Syria or receiving funding to do so. In this case, the UK military and theatre work closely with law enforcement, predominantly the Counter-Terrorism Command, SO15 liaison officers based in embassies, or local international coalition task forces, such as the Counter-ISIS Finance Group. The economic levers are the effects that need to be created for TFEL to form part of the multi-domain integration activity required in modern asymmetric conflict. The MOD is not aiming to be the lead agency in the overall illicit finance environment, rather to define those areas where defence's requirements for knowledge and guidance exist. Footnote 3. 
The lead agency will depend on the nature of the threat or adversary. The various agencies and their responsibilities are described in Annex B. Return to main text. As the MOD will not, as a matter of course, be a lead agency of cross-government activity in the TFEL arena, there is a requirement for a way to coordinate the MOD's response with those other areas of government. TFEL is a whole headquarters activity and successful deployment of TFEL requires an integrated approach including managing contacts and enabling activity. The next step for defence is to examine the role of TFEL in the MOD ecosystem and examine what options for its usage and governance are open to leadership. This JDN will examine what role defence can or should play in supporting UK government-led delivery of fused economic levers activity and effects in the future. It will examine from a force development perspective what capabilities, structures and policy permissions are likely to be required by defence to deliver such a capability. Terminology In this JDN, and in the field of economic warfare more broadly, several key terms are used. Given the numerous stakeholders in the TFEL arena, a myriad of differing terms and descriptions are used. For the purposes of this JDN, the following terminology will be used. Economic levers. Economic levers refer to the range of options available to create economic effects against a target. These can range from sanctions, both the implementation and threat as a tool of deterrence, through the munitions-based targeting of an adversary's profit-earning assets, to the funding of proxies or developing state-to-state -state relationships via investment and other financial favours. Economic levers can also be used to target the UK and could include funding insurgents to target UK interests overseas, funding disinformation campaigns, providing finance and resources to terrorist groups active in the UK, and using funding to undermine existing UK global strategic relations. Economic levers can compromise the ability of a state to pursue its own strategic objectives, create uncertainty and unrest in the population, and reduce the capability and willingness of a country to fight. Economic warfare. Economic warfare refers to using economic levers against an adversary in support of military aims and objectives. It can take the form of shipping or air transport blockades or sub-threshold activity such as denying access to cash point machines or electronic banking in a country. Financial intelligence. Financial intelligence, F-I-N-I-N-T, is information derived from the financial activity of entities of interest. Footnote 4. Financial intelligence is defined as the gathering of information about the financial affairs of entities of interest to understand their nature and capabilities and predict their intentions. Joint Doctrine Publication 0-01.1 UK Terminology Supplement to NATO Term Return to Main Text The term is commonly used within law enforcement and is traditionally used to identify tax evasion, money laundering or other criminal activity. FININT may also be involved in identifying the financial activity of terrorist organisations. The United States US, has pioneered its use within the military environment. Threat finance. Threat finance is examining how a threat actor generates, moves, uses and stores value using FIN, INT and other sources of information. This can provide insight into the threat actor's capability and modus operandi, as well as its potential financial vulnerabilities. Threat actors will require some form of financial component to support their activity. For example, Criminals profiting from the drugs trade or people trafficking, terrorist groups raising donations such as the IRA from Irish Americans, a non-state actor's exploitation of natural resources such as poppies in Afghanistan, or the funding of third-party groups to further an actor's aims such as Russian funding of Ukrainian rebels or US funding of the Contras in Nicaragua. 
threat finance and economic levers. TFEL refers to the combination of understanding threat finance and using economic levers in an offensive or defensive capability. It is used throughout this publication to describe the overall capability. Counter threat finance. Counter threat finance refers to the activities and actions taken to deny, disrupt, destroy or defeat an actor's ability to raise, move, use or store value. This includes targeting persons and entities that provide financial and material support to illicit networks, such as terrorists, insurgents, drugs and weapons traffickers, or corrupt government officials who seek to undermine their own government or the efforts of host nations, allied coalitions or other friendly actors. Multi-domain integration. A proposed definition for multi-domain integration is the posturing of military capabilities in concert with other instruments of national power, allies and partners, configured to sense, understand and orchestrate effects at the optimal tempo across the operational domains and levels of warfare. Footnote 5. Definition proposed in Joint Concept Note 1-20, Multi-Domain Integration. Return to main text. Hybrid Warfare. Hybrid warfare is described as the synchronised use of multiple instruments of power tailored to specific vulnerabilities across the full spectrum of societal functions to achieve synergistic effects. Footnote 6. Multinational Capability Development Campaign, MCDC, MCDC Countering Hybrid Warfare Project, Understanding Hybrid Warfare, January 2017, page 8. Return to main text. Target Systems Analysis. Target Systems Analysis has a NATO working definition of the holistic and dynamic intelligence assessment of all aspects of potential target sets, physical and psychological, to identify vulnerabilities which, if targeted by the appropriate capability, lethal or non-lethal, would achieve desired objectives. Footnote 7. Allied Joint Publication, AJP 3.9. Allied Joint Doctrine for Joint Targeting, Edition A, Version 1, April 2016. Return to main text. Application of threat finance and economic levers. Understanding when and how to apply economic levers as part of an integrated approach to address both state and non-state actors is more critical in today's globalised financial system than it has ever been. The health of a nation's economy, the funding available to a terrorist group or the wealth of an insurgency will often be a key contributor to the outcome of confrontation and conflict. Economic levers do not provide a standalone solution, but, almost without fail, will play a meaningful contributing role to the outcome of any confrontation. Understanding the economic dimension to a conflict and the opportunities and threats posed by economic levers must become central to the role of any military and wider government. Understanding the financial landscape is a critical component of developing a complete picture of an adversary's capabilities and thus finance-based measures should be included in initial thinking and planning both at the strategic and tactical levels of warfare. Consider the value financial analysis brought to the understanding of Islamic State's activities and vulnerabilities or the central importance of finance to the survival of state-backed proxies such as Hezbollah Economic warfare measures and effects span the spectrum of responses available to the UK government, from state-initiated public measures, such as sanctions, trade embargoes and tariffs, through more opaque, covert and deniable actions, to overt MOD-led actions, such as blockades and lethal attacks. Figure 1.1 illustrates how an understanding of the financial landscape creates planning options of effect both in an offensive and defensive context. Chapter 2 Chapter 2 explores the UK cross-government approach to engaging with economic warfare and related illicit finance to determine how the Ministry of Defence could support this activity. A quotation from Gideon Oliphant Murray, 
Second Viscount Elibank, questioning the proposed dissolution of the Ministry of Economic Warfare, Hansard, 17th of March, 1944. With our immense trade interests in the Far East, I cannot see that we can afford to leave the blockade entirely in the hands of the Americans without proper representation. Indeed, I feel that the blockade in the Far East should be a joint operation between the Ministry of Economic Warfare and whatever department exists for that purpose in the United States of America. For that purpose alone, I should have thought it was necessary to retain the Ministry of Economic Warfare until the war with Japan was concluded. I could get no satisfactory reply on that question. Chapter 2. UK Government Context Engaging with economic warfare and related illicit finance is a cross-government activity and cuts across an array of both policy and operational departments and agencies. The widely dispersed roles and responsibilities of these actors, with a mix of domestic and international focus, are detailed in Annex B. Departments with an international remit include the Department for International Trade, Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, FCDO, whose remit includes sanctions and provision of in-country capability development, Home Office, who liaise with international counterparts on illicit finance and hold the lead for strategies on countering illicit finance and terrorist financing, and National Crime Agency, who share financial intelligence, FININT, with other jurisdictions and undertake tactical collaboration through their international liaison officers. Her Majesty's Treasury, HM Treasury, has the lead across government for setting and implementing the standards and laws for financial compliance and regulations. This includes contributing to international standard setting, for example through its membership of the Financial Action Task Force, FATF. This group of 37 countries and two regional bodies, such as the European Commission, develops globally applicable standards to combat money laundering, terrorist financing and proceeds generating crimes, as well as strengthening the integrity of national, and thus global, financial systems and assessing their implementation. Through the FCDO and the UK's permanent membership of the United Nations Security Council, the UK plays a leading role in developing and implementing sanctions regimes used to restrict the activity of countries, companies and individuals, including by applying financial measures. Examples of this would include asset freezes or the sanctions applied against members of, or those affiliated with, Al-Qaeda, the Taliban or Islamic State, or Syrian and Iranian state officials. While some of this architecture, such as the work of law enforcement agencies to combat terrorist financing, may inform the Ministry of Defence, MOD, in general, the resources and capabilities required to support the MOD's threat finance and economic levers, TFEL capability, should to be maintained and developed by the MOD itself. On an ad hoc basis, the MOD has previously convened a TFEL capability, such as creating the Joint Improvised Explosive Device Analysis Centre, JIEDAC, during Operation Herrick in Afghanistan, which assembled cross-government threat finance expertise, such as that found in the National Terrorist Finance Investigation Unit in Counterterrorism Command, SO15. Such a capability, when stood up, has been in response to a specific threat situation rather than being maintained as a standing capability by the MOD and has had to be reconstituted for the next threat. Footnote 8. There is standing capability for counter-terrorist financing within the Ministry of Defence, MOD. Return to main text. This leads to a lack of institutional memory and knowledge drain. As the global financial networks become more complex, finding the suitable subject matter experts and organising them into single issue teams will become more difficult on such a basis and does not match the operational requirements of a headquarters. Furthermore, the costs of finding external consultants to assist in such teams is prohibitive due to the competition with the private sector for suitably qualified and experienced personnel. Globally, 
since the events of 9-11, there has been a heightened focus on threat finance, stemming from an increased requirement for terrorist groups such as Al-Qaeda to generate funding to train their group members, maintain their activities and launch their attacks. The following vignette explores the example further. The Global War on Terrorism Financing Since the attacks of 9-11, targeting the financing of terrorist groups has been a central pillar of the global response to terrorism. One objective of President George W. Bush as he launched his global war on terror was to starve the terrorists of funding, underlined by the revelation that the 9-11 hijackers had moved United States $300,000 through the US banking system. Footnote 9. United States Treasury Department. Contributions by the Department of the Treasury to the Financial War on Terrorism Fact Sheet, September 2002, page 2. Footnote 10. National Commission on Terrorist Attacks upon the United States. Monograph on Terrorist Financing, 21st of August 2004, page 3. Return to main text. This focus on terrorist financing spawned sanction designations from the United Nations and individual nations or blocs, for example the US or European Union. It led to the global requirement for governments to criminalise terrorist financing and it required the private sector, banks, money services, businesses and other financial actors to screen customers and transactions for potential signs of terrorist activity. Indeed, FATF created its counter-terrorist financing standards as a direct result of 9-11. Nearly 20 years since 9-11, combating terrorist financing remains a central part of the international response to terrorism, from destroying the money-making oil infrastructure of the Islamic State to investigating the financial networks of disrupted or executed loan actor or domestic terrorist attacks on the UK's streets. Footnote 11. For an extensive recent study on responses to terrorist financing, see Keatonage, Tom and Keen Florence, A Sharper Image, Advancing a Risk-Based Response to Terrorist Financing, Royal United Services Institute, Occasional Paper, March 2020. Return to main text. The focus on terrorist financing has been the central and often only response to threat finance deployed by governments. The UK and Group of Seven, G7 partners, created the FATF organisation explicitly to address these threats. Yet, whilst important, targeting terrorist financing is only one of the many economic levers that a government can apply. Put differently, failing to extend the UK's TFEL capability beyond terrorist financing represents a missed strategic opportunity and could leave the UK exposed. This opportunity is beginning to be addressed across the wider UK government community. In July 2019, jointly led by HM Treasury and the Home Office and in partnership with UK Finance, the UK's Banking Industry Association, the Economic Crime Plan 2019-2022 was published. That, alongside the public-private threat update, Economic Crime Key Judgments, focused on the threat posed by economic crime to the security and prosperity of the UK. Footnote 13. HM Government and UK Finance, Economic Crime Plan, 2019-2022, July 2019. Footnote 14. National Crime Agency and National Economic Crime Centre, Public-Private Threat Update, Economic Crime, Key Judgments, July 2019. Return to main text. Whilst the Economic Crime Plan 2019-2022 necessarily has a domestic focus, it does not neglect an international dimension that endeavours to deliver an ambitious international strategy to enhance security, prosperity and the UK's global influence. Footnote 15. Same as previous source. Page 58. Return to main text. Additionally, the nature of global trade, supply chains and threat actors means that a solely domestic focus is not appropriate. 
one element of the Economic Crime Plan 2019-2022's international strategy is a commitment to enhance the UK's overseas capabilities by developing a new hybrid platform, the International Centre of Excellence, that will bring together highly qualified public, private and academic expertise in understanding and addressing international illicit finance with capacity to both support overseas efforts and to enhance cooperation with priority jurisdictions. Footnote 16. Same as previous source. Page 62. Return to main text. The International Centre of Excellence is currently in the process of being established under FCDO leadership and has had MOD input during its development. The International Centre of Excellence's aim will be to inform policymakers and will see new coordinated networks of expertise dedicated to tackling illicit finance in existing and emerging regional and global financial centres being established via the Serious and Organised Crime Network, SOCnet, and the newly created FCDO Illicit Finance Network. Footnote 17. SOCnet, a key deliverable of the 2018 Serious and Organised Crime Strategy, is a tri-departmental network of 18 policy officers based overseas. It includes an illicit finance network with experts sitting in global financial centres. Footnote 18. HM Government and UK Finance Economic Crime Plan 2019 to 2022. July 2019. Page 62. Return to main text. Key points of Chapter 2. UK Government Context. Engaging with economic warfare and related illicit finance is a cross-government activity and cuts across an array of both policy and operational departments and agencies. Some of the UK government's architecture may inform the MOD. In general, the resources and capabilities required to support the MOD's threat finance capacity will need to be sourced and developed by the MOD itself. To date, the MOD's TFEL capability has been generated in response to a specific threat situation rather than being maintained as a standing capability alongside other MOD capabilities. The MOD should be able to deploy economic levers as part of its response to adversarial challenge. The MOD should develop an appropriate standing capability to ensure TFEL risks and opportunities presented by adversaries in its domain are addressed and enable coordinated docking into the UK's cross-government architecture. Chapter 3 Chapter 3 examines in detail what a Ministry of Defence threat finance and economic levers capability could look like and what roles it could provide. A quotation from Mustafa Abu al-Yazid, also known as Sheikh Said, high-ranking al-Qaeda official. As for the needs of the jihad in Afghanistan, the first of them is financial. The Mujahideen of the Taliban number in the thousands, but they lack funds. And there are hundreds wishing to carry out martyrdom-seeking operations, but they can't find the funds to equip themselves. So funding is the mainstay of the jihad. And here we would like to point out that those who perform jihad with their wealth should be certain to only send the funds to those responsible for finances and no other party, as to do otherwise leads to disunity and differences in the ranks of the Mujahideen. Chapter 3. What does this mean for the Ministry of Defence? Historically, military understanding of an adversary's financial and economic capability has been rooted in state-based analysis, determining the key industrial centres that fuel an economy, identifying and targeting key trade routes, and seeking, via diplomacy or force, to deter third-party nations from providing economic and financial assistance. In line with the rise in hostile state activity below the threshold of armed conflict, our understanding must be broadened to examine the threat finance implications for non-state actors as well. Where non-state actors are concerned, with increased urgency since the 9-11 attacks, domestic law enforcement and security forces have dedicated resources to understanding the financial modus operandi of threat actors 
including criminals and terrorists. Thus, whilst financial investigation and analysis are called domestic functions of most advanced governments, few militaries, with the notable exception of the United States and Italy, based on experience in campaigns in Afghanistan and Iraq, have formed permanent threat finance capabilities. Footnote 19. Blum David and Conway J. Edward, Counterterrorism and Threat Finance Analysis During Wartime, 1st edition, 2015, and Joint Staff, J-7, Joint and Coalition Warfighting, Commander's Handbook for Counter-Threat Finance, version 1.0, 13th of September 2011. Return to main text. Italy has its highly trained and capable Guardia di Finanza, a paramilitary gendarmerie that operates alongside the military, which it has deployed successfully throughout the Middle East and North Africa region. Threat finance is not only linked to terrorist groups. The UK government increasingly recognises the threats posed to the UK and its overseas assets by serious and organised crime that operates transnationally. Transnational organised crime groups exploit failed states or ungoverned and contested spaces to take advantage of corrupt governments and their military and intelligence services, using their territory as safe spaces from which to operate from and maximise profits. Organisations such as Hezbollah use state-sponsored proxies or private military contractors, such as the Wagner Group, a Russian paramilitary organisation, to fight wars and conflicts to avoid direct action. This is becoming the norm and a growth industry. The US's funding of the Mujahideen in Afghanistan and Russian activity in Ukraine, where it claimed to not be involved despite funding an array of groups opposed to the government of Kiev and arming and supporting them with its own forces and proxies, are further examples. This avoids escalation to actual war between larger states and can be used to influence desired outcomes without unpalatable loss of life in the sponsor's country. Funding is one of the ways support to proxies can be provided, which is often via complex and opaque methods to obfuscate the links between actors. Presenting, as proxies often do, a threat to the security and prosperity of UK and its interests, the Ministry of Defence, MOD, should therefore be integrating threat finance and economic levers, TFEL, based on an in-depth understanding of the financial system of a country into the overall planning process as it is often the first UK government department to deal with a particular threat actor. Close attention to the activities of proxy private military contractors such as the Wagner Group in guarding rare mineral assets or hydrocarbon activities is required. The Democratic Republic of the Congo Proxy Case Study The Democratic Republic of the Congo, DRC, is the third largest and fourth most populated state in Africa, with an estimated population of 66 million. The DRC is located in the centre of Africa and surrounded by nine countries. Consequently, developments in DRC inevitably affect the region's stability. Footnote 20. Gambino Anthony W. Congo, Securing Peace, Sustaining Progress. Council on Foreign Relations, 2008, page 9. Return to main text. In addition, the DRC has the largest deposits of various minerals, including diamonds, uranium, copper, zinc and columbite tantalites, Colton. The untapped mineral potential is valued at an estimated US $24 trillion, resulting in DRC probably being the country with more mineral reserves than any other country in the world. For example, the country has 45% of the world's cobalt reserves and produces more than half of the world's supply of cobalt. Footnote 21. Prunier Gerard, Why the Congo Matters, Atlantic Council, 2016, page 6. Return to main text. The country gained its independence from Belgium on the 30th of June, 1960. However, the newly independent state was quickly overwhelmed by political instability and chaos. Five days after the country gained independence, the Congolese military revolted, and six days after that, the province of Katanga seceded. Footnote 22. 
Gambino Anthony W. Congo Securing Peace, Sustaining Progress, Council on Foreign Relations, 2008, page 10. Return to main text. In the next four years, July 1960 to June 1964, the United Nations authorised the mission Operation des Nations Unies au Congo, ONUC, which was mandated to help the Congolese government to restore and maintain political and territorial integrity of the Congo, to help maintain law and order throughout the country, and to put into effect a wide and long-range programme of training and technical assistance. Nevertheless, 18 months after the departure of ONUC General Joseph Mobutu in 1965, with the help of Belgium and the US, Mobutu once again seized power, again through a military coup d'etat. Footnote 23. Yuzanov Artur et al. Colton, Congo and Conflict. Polonaise Case Study. Hague Centre for Strategic Studies, 2013, page 34. Return to main text. The First Congo War, 1996-1997, was driven by security and political concerns especially the unwillingness of Mobutu to deal with various armed groups based on the Congolese territory. The leader of the rebellion against Mobutu in 1996 was Laurent Kabila, a minor rebel leader in the early 1960s. The rebel Alliance des Forts Démocratiques pour la Libération du Congo, AFDL, was supported by Rwanda and Uganda. The funding of the AFDL, before they took power, was derived from mineral deals with foreign companies, with down payments amounting to an estimated US $70 million. Footnote 24. Yuzanov, Artur et al. Colton, Congo and Conflict, Polonaise Case Study, Hague Centre for Strategic Studies, 2013, page 57. Return to main text. In May 1997, Kabila seized control of the entire Congo, thus ending Mobutu's 32 years of dictatorship. Footnote 25. Gambino Anthony W. Congo, Securing Peace, Sustaining Progress, Council on Foreign Relations, 2008, page 11. Return to main text. Uganda, Rwanda and Burundi supported Kabila to create a buffer zone against their own insurgent groups that were active in the DRC. Yet Kabila never suppressed these insurgent groups in the country against his allies. As a result, the support from DRC eastern neighbours, Rwanda and Uganda, only lasted until spring 1998. Footnote 26. Kizangani Amizit, Conflict in the Democratic Republic of Congo, a mosaic of insurgent groups. International Journal on World Peace, September 2003, Page 67. Return to main text. In the following Second Congo War, 1998-2003, to the former Allies split their support. Rwanda supported the Rassemblement Congolais pour la Démocratie in Goma, RCD Goma, and Uganda supporting the other major rebel group, Le Mouvement de Libération du Congo, MLC. Footnote 27. Gambino Anthony W. Congo, Securing Peace, Sustaining Progress, Council on Foreign Relations, 2008, page 12. Return to main text. The Kabila-backed government was supported by Zimbabwe, Namibia and Angola. Both rebel groups and their allies exploited the mineral resources of the DRC to fund the war. Examples from the Rwanda-backed rebel group include Société Minière de Grand Lac, a company created with Belgian, South African and Rwandan partners to exploit coltan and gold in the Kivu areas, other major companies doing business in the DRC, such as Rwanda Metals and Grand Lac Metal, were either owned by the government or by RCD Goma leaders, Rwandan generals, or individuals very close to Rwandan President Kagam. An example from the Ugandan side is the Trinity and Victoria groups that were set up by people close to Museveni, President of Uganda, 
Co-owners include his son and brother to exploit DRC's diamonds, gold, coffee and timber. Footnote 28. Kizangani Amizit, Conflict in the Democratic Republic of Congo, a Mosaic of Insurgent Groups. International Journal on World Peace, September 2003, page 67. Return to main text. Official figures by the Bank of Uganda indicated that Uganda's gold exports increased from US $12.4 million in 1994 to 1995 to US $110 million in 1996. The availability of gold helped the Ugandans' balance of trade improve by almost US $600 million in 1999, although gold represented only 0.2% of exports in the 1996 to 1997 period. Likewise, Rwandan gold production remained quite minimal from 1995 to 1996, averaging 8 kilograms a year. Suddenly, its exports increased drastically after 1996. Furthermore, Rwanda and Uganda had no history of diamond production. However, from 1997 to 2001, Uganda's exports of diamonds earned its treasury some US $4.75 million, or the equivalent of 33,227 exported carats. Rwanda also earned close to US $3.5 million by exporting 46,218 carats of diamonds. Consequently, the direct export or the re-export of resources extracted from the DRC territories generated substantial financial resources for both countries. Footnote 29. Same as previous source. Page 68. Return to main text. The Rwandan government received direct payments from the RCD Goma in exchange for arms. To pay for these weapons, the RCD Goma collected a tax of 8% of total mineral exports from its own comptoirs, shops in addition to a US $15,000 annual licence fee. At the end of 2000, when the Colton price in London stood at a peak of US $210 per pound, the RCD Goma earned some US $2 million net profit from Colton in November and December alone. The RCD Goma leader, Adolf Onusumba, admitted that the organisation raised more or less US $200,000 $200,000 per month from diamonds, but Colton gave them some US $1 million a month in net profit. The RCD Goma was also heavily invested in the gold trade from the outset. It formed its own army mining brigade for use in the territories of Bafwasendi and Banalia in Oriental Province. The RCD Goma even signed a mining contract with the offshore Bank of Granada to organise an African Union reserve system for the financial administration and development of the Congo. Bemba, leader MLC, and Ugandan officers were also in partnership. From 1999 to 2001, they harvested coffee from plantations that belonged to private citizens who had fled Equateur province. Bemba also monopolised other products in his region, thereby ensuring himself a steady flow of hard currency. For example, the MLC maintained a 20% ad valorem export tax on diamonds under its control in the 1999-2000 to period to sustain the movement. Footnote 30. Kizangani Amizit, Conflict in the Democratic Republic of Congo, a Mosaic of Insurgent Groups, International Journal on World Peace, September 2003, page 69. Return to main text. The fact that Rwanda and Uganda controlled trade and trade routes meant that they could finance the war at no cost. Footnote 31. Same as previous source. Page 71. Return to main text. However, it was not only the rebel groups who relied on exploiting the mineral resources to finance the war, but also the Kabila government. In 1999 to 2001, the diamond mining company Societe Minière de Bakwanga in southern Kasai province turned over to the government 40% of its earnings 
and the copper cobalt General de Carrière et Mines gave a third of its profits to the government. The proceeds from cobalt and diamonds, which averaged US $770 million a year, allowed the Kabila government means to enrich their own ruling coalition to purchase weapons and to finance the war. Zimbabwean generals were also cashing in some US $10 million per month in the DRC as part of defending the DRC's sovereignty. Footnote 32, same as previous source, page 73. Return to main text. In July 1999, the six main African countries involved signed a ceasefire agreement in Lusaka, which was also signed by the main rebel groups MLC and RCD Goma. By 2000, the United Nations authorised Mission de l'Organisation des Nations Unies en République démocratique du Congo, MONUC, to monitor the ceasefire. However, fighting continued between rebel groups and the government. After the death of Kabila in 2001, new peace talks were held in 2002 in South Africa. Footnote 33. Makuchi Guilia, The War Report, 2018, Democratic Republic of the Congo, Conflict in the Eastern Region. Geneva Academy, January 2019, page 2. Return to main text. Finally, in December 2002, a peace agreement was signed by the DRC government and the main rebel groups, which marks the formal end of the Second Congo War. However, since the end of the war, there have been, and continue to be, several armed conflicts fought between the DRC government and rebel militias. An example is the M23 group, allegedly backed by the Rwandan government, that in November 2012 took the major city Goma, located in the North Kivu province. Only in December 2013 could the Congolese army, together with the United Nations Created Force Intervention Brigade, defeat the rebel group. Footnote 34. Marcucci Guilia, The War Report, 2018, Democratic Republic of the Congo, Conflict in the Eastern Region, Geneva Academy, January 2019, page 2. Return to main text. Today, the conflict remains a decentralised one, with over 120 armed groups active, especially in the eastern regions, without an overarching narrative. Footnote 35. Same as previous source, page 6. Return to main text. However, each group is financed by or linked to the exploitation of the DRC's mineral assets by overseas actors. To understand this in a province, there are 26 provinces, including Kinshasa, country or regional context, the financial and economic landscape needs to be a major consideration of any assessment. Figure 3.1 depicts the overlap between organised crime groups, illegal state activity and terrorism. The fact that they overlap can be seen in numerous modern and historical examples, from the East German security services funding the Bader meinhof terrorists, who in turn robbed banks, to the recent Italian discovery of a US $1 billion street value amphetamine haul brought into the country claimed by Italy to have been produced by Daesh. Footnote 36. Piri Madsen, Adam Smith Institute, Stasi, the East German Secret Police, 8th of February 2019. Footnote 37. There are some counterclaims as to the origin of the Amphetamine Hall. Middle East Monitor, Italy, police seized largest ever shipment of amphetamines, 2nd of July, 2020. Return to main text. Transnational organised crime groups would more likely be high-level traffickers sourcing large imports from abroad, potentially from new routes given decreased production due to the coronavirus pandemic, and from other production centres such as the Dutch province of Limburg. Footnote 38. Europol, EU drug market, impact of COVID-19, 29th of May 2020, and Sora Patrick, The Telegraph, 
Coronavirus creates problems and opportunities for world's drug traffickers. 7th of May, 2020. Return to main text. In considering the importance and relevance of a potential threat finance capability, the MOD needs to answer two primary questions. What role can a threat finance capability play in understanding an actor's finances and the planning and execution of activities to disrupt it? If a threat finance capability is desirable, what form and focus should this capability take and how should it be deployed as part of target systems analysis? What role can a threat finance capability play? The global threat landscape has become ever more complex and highly networked. Threats do not stay neatly within borders and the responses are not contained within a defined geographic area of operation. What often connects and supports adversary networks is finance. Thus, in devising methods for countering the adversary, a detailed understanding of financial linkages and vulnerabilities is a major element of the planning and targeting process to counter the threat. Developing a MOD TFEL capability will add a valuable additional dimension to target systems analysis. In considering the response to a particular threat, a lethal option may not always be the appropriate and proportionate choice. Footnote 39 The inclusion of threat finance and economic levers, TFEL objectives, in targeting operations creates a highly disruptive non-lethal effect, often targeting high-value individuals with skill sets and developed relationships that are hard to replace in the vast majority of threat groups. Joint Improvised Explosive Device Analysis Centre, JIEDAC, Threat Finance, Its Importance to Military Operations, J-I-E-D-A-C slash 14 slash 008. Return to main text. For example, in 2015, Syrian businessman George Haswani and his co-owned Syrian company, H-E-S-C-O Engineering and Construction Company, were sanctioned by both the European Union, and therefore the UK, and the US for orchestrating oil sales by the Syrian regime from Islamic State. These sales provided the Islamic State with valuable income and the regime with vital fuel supplies. Footnote 40. United States Treasury. Treasury sanctions networks providing support to the government of Syria, including for facilitating Syrian government oil purchases from ISIL, November 2015, and European Union Council implementing regulation 2015-375, 6th of March 2015. It should be noted that the measures applied against Haswani by the European Union were reversed on appeal in 2017 and have been the subject of ongoing legal arguments. Implementing Regulation EU No. 36-2012 concerning restrictive measures in view of the situation in Syria. Return to main text. Equally, in targeting Islamic State oil assets, threat finance analysis may inform the munitions-based targeting of installations and assets. The MOD has a central role to play in both offensive and defensive terms and therefore developing a standing threat finance capability should be a logical conclusion. It should be a tool that is considered as part of target systems analysis and the MOD's role in deterrence. Footnote 41. For further discussion of deterrence, see Joint Doctrine Note 1-19, Deterrence, the Defence Contribution. Return to main text. As evident from the case studies in Annex A, economic levers can be used to exert meaningful pressure on adversaries and as part of sub-threshold hostile state activity used by adversaries against the UK and its interests. Failing to develop a threat finance capability leaves the MOD and the UK at a disadvantage that is unable to recognise the extent to which economic levers can support in developing a range of tactical responses. As noted, intelligence derived from analysis of financial data 
can provide much greater value in both understanding and predicting the adversary's activities, as well as providing for precise targeting to disrupt them. Footnote 42. Keen Shima D. Operationalizing Counter Threat Finance Strategies, 1st edition, December 2014. Return to main text. Furthermore, Financial data can provide valuable and previously unknown insights into adversary networks, in particular insights into the networks that support and sustain adversaries who may often be located beyond the immediate area of UK operations. Conflict over resources, the transformation from simmering hostility to all-out conflict between factions within a nation-state, and the strategic decision-making of non-state actors such as Islamic State or Al-Shabaab or organised crime groups can most often be traced to economics. An understanding of an actor's financial and economic levers does not only provide a tactical capability, but can also help the MOD risk assess and potentially anticipate areas of conflict. This analysis will feed into any wider human security analysis that is being conducted for example, as part of the conflict analysis of root causes and drivers. An understanding of finance can also help shape tactical outcomes. For example, an analysis of key financial players such as Hawaladas, the salary structure of fighters or the financial incentives of suppliers of an adversary can provide a clearer understanding of the behaviour and vulnerabilities of an adversary. Footnote 43 Association of Certified Anti-Money Laundering Specialists in Search of the Hawalada, 29th of August 2011. Return to main text. The following factors contribute to the financial viability of an adversary. Successfully raising slash soliciting, controlling and managing, accounting for, storing, transferring, distributing and dispersing funds dispersing funds and making payments on time with a minimal threat of interdiction and a degree of accountability, meeting expected and unforeseen financial obligations, transferring funds quickly and with minimal threat of interdiction, maintaining a reliable and steady flow of income, preferably from multiple income streams, growing and expanding a profitable, self-sustaining threat organisation over time and space, and withstanding temporary financial setbacks by maintaining a cash-slash-asset reserve. Footnote 44. Joint Staff, J-7, Joint and Coalition Warfighting. Commander's Handbook for Counter-Threat Finance, version 1.0. 13th of September, 2011, pages 1 to 4. Return to main text. Therefore, To successfully target these factors, an actor would need to change its modus operandi. It may need to restrict its activities to conserve funding, therefore reducing its ability to project its threat, and turn to alternative sources of funding that may present greater risks of interdiction or reduce support for their activities, such as increasing taxes or tolls on local populations. Developing an understanding of any financial hostile state activity and the financial flows associated with their activity below the threshold of armed conflict is essential. This understanding will ensure that defence can employ its capabilities to mitigate and counter these threats. What expertise is required? Above all, gaining a solid understanding of the financial landscape, be it state or non-state related, requires an understanding of formal and informal banking systems in addition to analytical skills. Developing a threat finance capability is less about understanding economics, although this may be helpful, and more about understanding how financial networks are constructed and the ability to gather and exploit financial intelligence, FININT. Footnote 45. Financial intelligence is defined as the gathering of information about the financial affairs of entities of interest to understand their nature and capabilities and predict their intentions. Joint Doctrine Publication 0-01.1, 
UK terminology supplement to NATO term. Return to main text. This may include mapping the financial infrastructure of a country, its banks, money service businesses and hawaladas, and its international connections, or the individual networks of threat actors by analysing bank accounts and payment ledgers. State tolerance for opacity and risk within the financial sector is also another important factor to consider. Thus, in addition to leveraging extant relevant defence intelligence capabilities, the expertise required to develop this capability may come from sources outside of the MOD, such as areas of the private sector, for example, banking, payments and financial technology companies. As part of establishing a TFEL capability, the MOD will need to take advantage of the training offered within the UK government for developing financial investigators. The MOD may also need to develop its own FININT and TFEL-based training courses, drawing on the range of financial and economic expertise that already exists across government. This could include expertise within the financial investigator community, at the National Crime Agency and National Terrorist Financial Investigations Unit, as well as leveraging relevant skills from reservists from units such as Specialist Group Military Intelligence and 77th Brigade, using their relationships with other government departments and non-governmental organisations. Training and education to provide suitably qualified and, in time, experienced personnel should be broadened to include personnel from across a headquarters and not solely defence intelligence personnel. Adversary financial networks will often cross borders involving actors outside the immediate area of military operations. Therefore, developing or leveraging existing skills and capabilities that operate beyond the immediate area of military operations will be important. This may require the MOD to work in partnership with other parts of the UK government that have traditionally focused on criminal financial activity in foreign countries. For example, National Crime Agency International Liaison Officers working with foreign law enforcement agencies. What information is required? Whether in the context of a nation state or a terrorist group, FININT can complement existing intelligence by providing additional supporting evidence as well as offering new leads to detect activities or networks that were previously unknown. Footnote 46. Keen Shima D. Operationalising Counter-Threat Finance Strategies, 1st Edition, December 2014, page 22. Return to main text. The following list of questions, although not exhaustive, gives an example of the kind of questions which can be answered by FININT that can in turn inform the military planning or targeting process and result in a number of courses of action for senior commanders to consider. Who are the financiers and donors that provide financial resources, services and other items of value to adversaries and what are their motivations? What methods do adversaries use to raise, launder, transfer, store, secure, manage, account for, gain access to, distribute or disperse funds. Which of these fundraising methods are local? Which of these fundraising methods is most critical to the financial operations of the adversary? Who are the money service providers and facilitators in the group? Who are the financial managers, financial planners, investment managers financial security operators, fundraisers, fund and tax collectors, bookkeepers, auditors, couriers and financial facilitators in the group. How are adversary personnel moving their money between and within operational areas and safe havens? Where and how are the adversary personnel spending their money? Although FININT can be gathered from government sources, such as tax authorities or the Benefits Payment Office, the valuable sources of such information often lie in the private sector, with banks, money service businesses and hawaladas. Keeping detailed transaction records 
is a prerequisite for operating an effective and trustworthy financial institution. It is also a legal requirement for financial service providers to closely monitor these transactions for suspicious activity and report such suspicions to law enforcement. Thus, gaining access to such transaction records can provide a detailed insight into the activities and connections of a subject of interest. In an age of increased mobile or internet-based banking, materials such as computers and smartphones can provide valuable FININT in addition to the communications data that is most typically exploited following their acquisition. From a different perspective, banks and money service businesses that provide online services can very often identify the location of and the device from which a transaction was conducted, providing another valuable source of intelligence. An example is provided by the operations against Daesh across Syria and Iraq, targeting the group sources of funding, particularly the region's oil infrastructure and cash storage facilities. These operations were a vital part of the international coalition's response on the basis that Islamic State's ambition to take, hold and control territory would require extensive funding. Footnote 47. Cooper H. and Shit E. The New York Times. ISIS official killed in US raid in Syria, Pentagon says. 16th of May, 2015. Return to main text. Identifying and then destroying these sources of income restricted the group's ability to operate. This was, and still is to a great extent, coordinated through the US, Italian and Saudi Arabian-led counter-ISIS finance group. Footnote 48. US Department of the Treasury, counter-ISIS finance group leaders issued joint statement. 28th of August 2020. Return to main text. Financial information is often available in operational theatres via sensitive site exploitation. This information should be part of the intelligence collection plan to be gathered by those in the operating environment. The value of this information must be universally recognised and the MOD must have the necessary resources available to analyse and exploit this information to enhance the understanding of a given scenario, threat or area of operation. It should also be clear that the use of economic levers and the responses to threat finance activity are highly versatile and can be applied across a range of cases from an array of perspectives, including against states or insurgent and terrorist groups, at a diplomatic level engaging international bodies such as the United Nations, or as a component of military action. But the central premise of TFEL is to provide opportunities for defending against and exploiting vulnerabilities created by financial activity. Developing a capability in this area would be entirely consistent with the MOD's mission to protect our people, territories, values and interests at home and overseas through strong armed forces and in partnership with allies to ensure our security, support our national interests and safeguard our prosperity. Footnote 49. See what the Ministry of Defence does. Return to main text. The United States military approach to threat finance and economic levers. Counter threat finance, CTF, has been an essential component of the US Department of Defence, DOD, response to the insurgencies in both Iraq and Afghanistan. For the DoD, since current and future adversaries rely on several funding sources to operate and identifying and thwarting financial supply lines are a proven means of disrupting threats to US national security, CTF is an important capability in DoD and the services. Ultimately, success in CTF will depend on DoD's ability to integrate with, support and complement other US government, USG, multinational and host nation activities. Footnote 50. Joint Staff, J7, Joint and Coalition Warfighting, The Commander's Handbook for Counter-Threat Finance, version 1.0, 13th of September, 2011. 
page 2-1. Return to main text. As a result, the DoD conducts operations from the strategic to tactical level to exploit, counter and potentially target the destruction of adversaries' finance networks. Develops and includes integrated capabilities in force planning constructs to exploit and counter financial networks that negatively affect US interests and creates a comprehensive and standardised framework for targeting an adversary's financial infrastructures for major vulnerabilities. And works with partners in the intelligence community to expand the collection, analysis, dissemination and exploitation of CTF intelligence and integrate other US government CTF capabilities into the DoD planning process when appropriate. Footnote 51. Same as previous source, pages 2-2 to 2-3. Return to main text. The US military deployments in Iraq and Afghanistan saw CTF become a notable element of the DoD's activity in those theatres by generating threat finance cells. Footnote 52. Same as previous source, pages 2-5 to 2-6. Return to main text. For example, the Iraq threat finance cell was established in 2005 with the mission to improve US efforts to gather, analyse and disseminate intelligence relating to the financial networks of insurgents, terrorists and militias in Iraq. Footnote 53. Jacobson Michael and Levitt Matthew, The Money Trail, Finding, Following, Freezing Terrorist Finances, The Washington Institute for Near East Policy, Policy Focus 89, 24th of November 2008, page 17. Return to main text. The importance of a TFEL capability to DOD is clear and is mainstreamed into both the strategic thinking and operational activities of the US military. Key standing capabilities of the US military include leveraging FININT as part of developing an understanding of threat pictures and target analysis, selecting a threat finance-based response to address and neutralise a threat, for example, in partnership with the sanctions designation capability of the US Treasury and ensuring sensitive site exploitation includes gathering financial information. A note of caution. Targeting an adversary's financial networks or restricting a nation's economic and financial connection can be decisive, but care should be taken to anticipate and mitigate unintended consequences and ensure that it is only the intended target of financial restrictions and disruption actions that are impacted. Footnote 54. Consider, for example, the unintended consequences of United Nations Security Council economic sanctions on Iraq following Saddam's invasion of Kuwait in 1991. For more details, see Reuben Michael, Sanctions on Iraq, a Valid Anti-American Grievance, Middle East Review of International Affairs Journal, December 2001. Return to main text. For example, financial channels supporting humanitarian activity can be collateral damage of sanctions regimes and other activity aimed at disrupting the financial activity of a state or insurgent group. This is because financial institutions and money service businesses withdraw their services in regions where they are concerned They may fall foul of these restriction requirements and thus face penalties or be sanctioned themselves as a result. Furthermore, targeting to destroy a Hawalada who is providing money transfer services to an insurgent group or key threat actor may also disrupt the financial support upon which a region's population relies, thus potentially increasing insurgent support as a result. It must also be considered that the UK's legislative environment is different to, for example, that of the US. The Crime and Courts Act 2013 Section 7 allows a legislative information sharing gateway for reports of suspicious financial activity from the private sector. Its purpose, however, 
is to support law enforcement, not the military. Indeed, the consequences of potential lethal action as a result of the aforementioned information are certainly not foreseen by current UK law. The Patriot Act in the US provides a far wider range of options. The private sector may well view munitions-based targeting as a direct result of data it has submitted to law enforcement as unsupportable and this would undermine UK leading activities such as the Joint Money Laundering Intelligence Task Force, JMLIT, seen as a global best-in-class of public-private partnership. Consideration must also be given to what can happen when short-term solutions, such as safe corridors for money transmission, are no longer supported by a military administration or local arrangement in a conflict zone. Reliable, locally viable structures must be created and supported, and this must be done in conjunction with other national and international bodies, so we do not exacerbate the problems trying to be solved. The US can weaponise the US dollar as the world's major reserve currency in a way that the UK cannot weaponise sterling. Due to the legislative requirements to use US entities or correspondent banks to enact transactions in the dollar, the US can influence outcomes by denying or threatening to deny access to dollar transactions in the formal banking system. Footnote 55. Glazer, Emily and Jilzenrath John, Wall Street Journal. US cut cash to Iraq on Iran, ISIS fears. 3rd of November, 2015. Return to main text. The threat of this denial of access enables the US executive to force states and their financial institutions into courses of action that they would not normally choose. Footnote 56. Zoffer Joshua P., the dollar and the United States' exorbitant power to sanction. The American Society of International Law, Volume 113, 29th of April, 2019. Return to main text. The US enforces the use of the dollar in an extraterritorial manner as a policy tool controlled by the US Treasury and is enabled by a wide variety of organisations from the DOD to the Secret Service, who are partly set up to protect the currency. Footnote 57. UK Parliament. The UK's role in the economic war against ISIL. Isolating ISIL from financial systems. 7th of July, 2016. Return to main text. This can also lead to allegations of interference and US imperialism in the economy and cause unwanted second-order effects such as the exponential growth of alternative cryptocurrencies or Chinese policy to make the renminbi a reserve currency of choice. It is important to anticipate and consider TFVL at the start of any MOD planning. This will ensure that courses of action are mitigated against the possible unintended consequences of deploying these levers or activities. Key points of Chapter 3 what does this mean for the Ministry of Defence? In summary, the MOD TFEL could do the following. Support domestic UK agencies and government activities, for example partnering with the National Crime Agency and or host government law enforcement agencies. Enhance and direct military activity and integrate it into the targeting cycle for both munitions and non-munitions based targets. This will bolster the MOD's deterrence capabilities and provide commanders with the suite of options and an understanding of how to engage with partners across government to enable them. Gather intelligence. TFEL can answer questions relating to the strategic capability and viability of an organisation, for example ISIL revenue and reserves, through operational, a threat actor's vulnerabilities, to tactical, networks and informing disruptions. An effective way of achieving this is using threat finance cells taking information from the battlefield, such as encounter ISIL operations, and turning it into actionable intelligence for the MOD or other government departments. The sensitive site exploitation capability that threat finance cells could achieve would enable the MOD to achieve outcomes and courses of action which would work in operations at a tactical 
and strategic level in cooperation with other government departments. Work with alliances and partners drawing on individual countries' strengths to achieve mutually desirable outcomes. Care should be taken to anticipate and mitigate unintended consequences and ensure that it is only the intended target of financial restrictions and disruption actions that are impacted. Chapter 4 Chapter 4 examines the UK's vulnerabilities to hostile state and non-state actors' use of economic warfare and the growth of cybercrime. It explores how the Ministry of Defence must contribute to national resilience as well as protecting itself from these threats. A quotation from Stuart Levy, Under Secretary for Terrorism and Financial Intelligence Testimony, 2008. States engaged in illicit conduct pose a particular challenge. They hide behind a veil of legitimacy, disguising their activities such as weapon sales or procurement through the use of front companies and intermediaries. In some cases, they intentionally obscure the nature of their financial activities to evade detection and avoid suspicion. We've had important successes countering the illicit financial activity of both North Korea and Iran by using a combination of financial measures fuelled by financial intelligence to target their conduct in a way that is persuasive both for other governments and the private sector. Chapter 4 The UK's vulnerability to threat finance and economic levers. The focus of this joint doctrine note has so far been on the UK's use of economic levers and counter threat finance capabilities against adversaries or in support of allies. However, the open nature of the UK's economy, our position as an island, and the centrality of the City of London to global finance and the well being of the UK economy leaves the nation vulnerable to economic warfare. Footnote 58. In 2018, the financial services sector contributed £132 billion to the UK economy, 6.9% of total economic output, 1.1 million financial services jobs in the UK, 3.1% of all jobs, and £29 billion in tax. Rhodes Chris Financial Services Contribution to the UK Economy. House of Commons Library Briefing Paper, number 6193, 31st of July, 2019. Return to main text. Although other government departments may take the lead in combating the homeland threat, the Ministry of Defence, MOD, must have a capability to support them. The MOD's strategic planners, should not disconnect homeland security from international security. The possibility of hostile acquisition of the MOD's suppliers to either deny the MOD access to its supply chain or to access intellectual property for espionage further raises the importance of this requirement to the MOD. Finance and the cyber threat. The UK's high street banks and other financial institutions are repeatedly subject to an ever-increasing number of cyber attacks. Most attacks against the sector are motivated by profit and carried out by criminal groups, although a smaller number of attacks may be linked to hostile state activity. These attacks range from low-level attempts to steal customer data to enable fraud activities, through to more sophisticated intrusions aimed at accessing payment systems or even directly disrupting operations. A smaller number of attacks could involve more traditional espionage. Perhaps of even greater concern is that, as the financial markets increasingly automate, they will potentially become more vulnerable to operational technology threats. For example, disrupting pricing sources which could subtly undermine the financial sector and not become obvious until it was too late and confidence in the markets had been undermined. As the financial system in the UK becomes further digitised, the integrity of the technology used for these developments must be carefully considered to ensure that, by embracing the benefits of technology, the UK does not leave itself open and vulnerable to future aggressive economic warfare activity by state or non-state actors. 
Whilst the criminal element of these attacks is not the domain of the MOD, the rising prevalence of state-led attacks on a nation's financial system clearly represent a threat to UK national security. Finance and hostile state activity Hostile state activity is the use of overt and covert actions, unethical and potentially illegal under international law, orchestrated by foreign governments that undermines, or threatens, the UK's national security, the integrity of its democracy, the functioning of the state, its public safety, reputation or economic prosperity. A feature of hostile state activity is the exploitation of information through disinformation and the use of misinformation. Information operations are not new. Propaganda has been a central pillar of state influence campaigns for centuries. Yet with the advent of social media, the ease with which such campaigns can be mounted and the resulting effectiveness of those campaigns has been magnified. A further area in which the UK faces an economic warfare threat is hostile state actors providing funding to support disinformation and negative media campaigns in the UK. Evidence suggests that hostile state actors, or those acting on behalf of such states, have increasingly sought to influence the outcome of elections and broader public sentiment towards national governments via social media campaigns by distorting the public's perception of governments or key figures of authority. The funding of this type of activity must be a priority target to understand, mitigate or destroy. The use of disinformation and misinformation. The following examples are about disinformation and misinformation, which of course must be paid for and therefore must be a focus of our threat finance activity to understand about and counter adversaries' activities. United States Presidential Elections 2016 In the run-up to the 2016 United States presidential elections, Russian agents engaged in a campaign to undermine public faith in the US democratic process, denigrate Secretary Clinton and harm her electability and potential presidency. Footnote 59 Office of the Director of National Intelligence Background to Assessing Russian Activities and Intentions in Recent US Elections The Analytic Process and Cyber Incident Attribution 6th of January 2017, page 2 Return to Main Text The campaign included the spread of polarised views on social media, the cyber attack on the Democratic National Committee and Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, and the leaking of emails and documents to damage Hillary Clinton's candidacy. Footnote 60. Abrams Abigail. Time. Here's what we know so far about Russia's 2016 meddling. 18th of April, 2019. Return to main text. Campaign against German North Atlantic Treaty Organisation soldiers. On 14th of February... 2017, emails claiming that German soldiers had raped an underage Lithuanian girl were sent to the President of the Lithuanian Parliament and various Lithuanian media outlets. The charges were investigated, but no evidence was found to verify the claims. The emails are part of a disinformation campaign against the North Atlantic Treaty Organisation, NATO, and especially the Enhanced Forward Presence Mission, in NATO's Eastern Territories. Footnote 61. Deutsche Welle. NATO. Russia targeted German army with fake news campaign. 16th of February, 2017. Return to main text. To combat the disinformation campaign from Russia against the European Union, the European Union established the East Stratcom Task Force in September 2015. Later, the European External Action Services set up two additional task forces to counter disinformation in other areas of the European Union's neighbourhood, the Western Balkans Task Force and the Task Force South. Footnote 62. 
Bazina Christine et al. European Policy Blueprint for Countering Authoritarian Interference in Democracies. German Marshall Fund of the United States. 25th of June 2019. Page 41. Return to Main Text. The Ministry of Defence and Threat Finance and Economic Levers Threats to the UK. Cyber attacks on the UK's banking system are not the immediate domain of a MOD operation, but such campaigns are a clear threat to national security. Therefore, the MOD must be aware of and have a capability to monitor, understand and learn from such incidents. In contrast, some finance-based threats to the UK homeland are most certainly the domain of the MOD. For example, a threat actor moving funds through Hawaladas to fund external operations which may include UK targets. The ungoverned spaces of Somalia allow the export of charcoal and an East Africa drugs corridor helps finance Al-Shabaab and threatens UK citizens in the region and at home. And financial information gathered on the battlefield may help identify UK foreign fighters or provide evidence of UK-based or other associated supporters that can be used to mount law enforcement action in the UK or develop sanction designations at a regional or international level. Threat Finance and Economic Levers Problem Set A Hypothetical Case Study To demonstrate the relevance of threat finance to the UK military, the following is a hypothetical case of a Threat Finance and Economic Levers, TFEL, problem set. On Friday 31st December 2021, the UK and many European nations are preparing for the first real New Year's Eve celebrations since the end of the COVID-19 pandemic. A treatment and vaccine have been found, and after nearly two long years of alternating lockdown and easing, the public are going out in victorious celebration. The UK has planned unprecedented street parties in London, Edinburgh, Cardiff and Belfast. The parties will be free-ticketed affairs. The street parties are hugely anticipated and there has been much speculation in the press about the fireworks. It has been widely accepted that the last two years has tested the public and police authorities and their relationship at times has been fractious. The police authorities in the UK and throughout Europe are highly attuned to the fact that they have been seen as enforcers of unprecedented encroachment on civil liberties to combat the pandemic. There is an overall feeling of relief and letting down of guards and the police are keen to use this event to spread goodwill and repair some damage. It could be likened to this generation's Victory in Europe VE Day celebration. At 0015 hours, a group of individuals pledging allegiance to the popular Islamic Front of Lunrovia, PFIL, enter among the crowds across the four UK locations with suicide vests and AK-47s, with the intent of causing maximum chaos. The results of the synchronised attacks are catastrophic, with large-scale casualties. Paris, Berlin and Amsterdam also suffer a similar fate. The scale of the attack is ambitious, deadly but also extremely opportunistic, taking advantage of the mood of the nation. Closed circuit television, CCTV evidence, shows groups of attackers getting out of a series of minibuses located near the street parties in London, Edinburgh, Cardiff and Belfast. The vans were all hired from the same place on the 29th of December 2021 with vehicle registration numbers that Automatic Number Plate Recognition, AMPR, traces to a hire firm in Bridlington. On raiding the small local firm, the counter-terrorism unit quickly find that due to the pandemic, the owners have run all their business remotely, with document scans and electronic transfers of money, with virtually no face-to-face client interaction. Their records identify one of the attackers and the details of her name allow law enforcement to approach the Joint Money Laundering Intelligence Task Force, JMLIT, banks to trace the funds. 
Through this, it is quickly identified that the funds to rent the minibuses came via a Greek Cypriot money service business operating in the UK. This business is known to operate in a number of countries in the Middle East and North Africa, including Lomrovia. The business is immediately very cooperative with law enforcement requests for intelligence, and a direct line of funding from the attacker's account to Lomrovia can be established through a local money service business. The local money service business has been on a US watch list for some time, linked to the funding of attacks against US embassy personnel in Lomrovia. This evidence provides a link given credence to the PFIL claims of having carried out the attacks. The Lomrovian government is sympathetic to the PIFL and refuses to cooperate with international requests for information and enforcement. There is credible imagery intelligence that suggests that there are a significant number of suspected terrorist training camps in Lonrovia. There is a genuine fear of further attack in the European capitals and calls for the invoking of NATO Article 5 due to the substantial nature of the attack. But the ghost of Afghanistan brings caution to the minds of ministers and senior military officials. The TFEL functions within the MOD are now called on to advise on the accuracy and origin of the financial information and contribute to the courses of action briefings that the MOD senior leadership team are preparing for government. Would taking direct action against the money service business stop further funding or does the network of terrorist support span far more widely? And if so, how can further atrocities be stopped? If the government of Lomrovia is not stopping terrorist funding, then what is in the toolkit for the UK government and coalition allies from sanctions to kinetic action? If the MOD did not have an established TFEL capability of its own, the senior leadership team would not be able to be internally briefed and prepared with a full understanding of the evidence being presented. And the so what of this evidence when they meet with other government departments to react to the attacks. The UK government and partners decide that Lomrovia is actively engaged in training terrorists and funding terrorism, but there would be little UK public support for a military intervention like Afghanistan. It is decided that the MOD should prepare a list for both munitions, lethal, and non-munitions based targeting, which in conjunction with diplomatic and partners across government activity, such as freezing accounts of Lomrovian government supporters, will seek to provide the cognitive change required in Lomrovia. The TFEL team are crucial in converting the evidence provided by the financial links from law enforcement into the targeting cycle. They will also provide guidance to the legal advisers on the legality and permissions required to use information obtained via a Section 7 gateway of the Crime and Courts Act 2013 for this purpose. They also liaise with other parts of the government, including Counter-Terrorism Command, SO15, National Terrorist Financial Investigation Unit. It is the MOD that will be responsible for targeted strikes on terrorist training camps and financing operations, and it will need to be able to justify these actions. Hence, overall, this requires efforts and effects across multiple government departments to be integrated, which will ultimately result in the threat to the nation being tackled, potentially including through munitions-based targeting or more general defence activity, such as defence engagement and peacekeeping operations, through to more offensive activities, including enforcement, blockades and destructing networks, facilities and enablers. Key points from Chapter 4 The UK's vulnerability to threat finance and economic levers As an open economy, the UK is itself vulnerable to TFEL applied by hostile state and non-state actors. Cyber provides an ideal vector for mounting finance-based attacks on the UK. Hostile state actors' finance can also be used to finance disinformation and misinformation campaigns that undermine the UK democratic process and promote conspiracy theories via social media. 
While economic threats to the UK homeland are most often the domain of law enforcement, the effects and impacts of such threats are certainly within the resilience domain and interest of the MOD. TFEL can play a valuable role in justifying and supporting the MOD's national security responses. Chapter 5 Chapter 5 summarises the threats faced, the role of the Ministry of Defence and discusses how to grow the Ministry of Defence's threat finance capability for the future. A quotation from David H. Petraeus, Commander of United States Central Command, praising Saudi Arabia's religious leaders for taking a major step toward promoting broader counter-terrorism cooperation by their recent rejection of financing terrorism as un-Islamic in 2010. This ruling makes clear that the struggle against terrorist financing is not just an American or Western concern, but a global threat. Chapter 5 Conclusions and Recommendations The 2013-2014 Agile Warrior Report noted in a chapter on alternative currencies and financial flows that understanding how money, in all its forms, is generated and moves allows a better understanding of power relationships. In instances where troops deploy and need to build a rapid understanding of the situation, understanding the financial situation can give a very useful perspective. Thus, developing this understanding at the tactical level without interfering with work being handled at the strategic level with other agencies and government departments, should be explored. The value of such a capability was demonstrated by the now-defunct Joint Improvised Explosive Device Analysis Centre, JIEDAC, which brought together cross-government capabilities to develop a threat finance response to support Operation Herrick in Afghanistan. At a tactical level, Such a unit can mount dedicated follow-the-money operations to help identify and disrupt targets who often have specialist skills that are not easily replaced, thus amplifying the disruptive effect of targeting their activities. At a strategic level, a clear and up-to-date understanding of the financial vulnerabilities of both potential adversaries, state or non-state, and the UK will allow the Ministry of Defence MOD to more effectively meet its objective of working for a secure and prosperous UK with global reach and influence. The lack of a standing threat finance and economic levers TFEL capability to task financial intelligence FIN, INT, analysis and related planning deprives the MOD of an important and proven capability. Whilst a TFEL capability will not, in and of itself, entirely neutralise an adversary's will or operational ability, this joint doctrine note shows that a TFEL capability is a fundamental requirement to ensure the MOD can effectively conduct activity against hostile actors in a multi-domain and sub-threshold battle space of the present and future. Developing this capability does not represent solely a standalone MOD capacity. Rather, it represents a valuable additional capability that can support existing operations, provide greater reach than conventional forces by being able to operate across borders, and overall provide an additional dimension for understanding and disrupting an adversary. Providing this capability is also cost-effective when compared to deploying personnel or expensive equipment to achieve the same ends. Establishing a standing MOD TFEL capability will provide a valuable additional dimension to the MOD toolkit at both the operational and strategic level to better support partners across government and agencies as well as plan and prosecute TFEL effects. Where the MOD has developed this capability on a reactive basis, notably the creation of JIEDAC within Operation Herrick, it has proved its worth. A more strategic and permanent approach to TFEL would serve the MOD well. Currently, without the full capability, 
the MOD are not actively listening for signals of economic levers being used against the UK. The threat might manifest without any reactive advantage afforded by monitoring its use. Part of any formed capability is to assist in monitoring for signals of activities being waged against the UK's interests. There is an opportunity for defence to provide thought leadership in the TFEL arena and create a strategic capability that provides understanding and optionality for the senior leadership team in a highly cost-effective manner. The MOD should use this opportunity to lead other allied nations who do not have the opportunities offered by the weaponized United States dollar to impact adversaries. Key points from Chapter 5 Conclusions and Recommendations In the future, the MOD should look to do the following. Integrate a TFEL capability into existing MOD intelligence and target systems analysis structures. Identify and draw on existing MOD resources and specialists engaged in or exhibiting a high degree of subject matter expertise competency in TFEL. Source and develop the necessary skilled staff to engage with topics that are, in general, unfamiliar to the MOD and military staff. Cultivate a culture of TFEL understanding among analysts and military personnel on the ground in relation to sensitive site exploitation. Develop connections with existing government TFEL capabilities to identify the significant gaps that the MOD should address and leverage existing UK government and allied partners' capabilities where relevant. Annex A. Threat finance and economic levers through history. Throughout history, a range of threat finance and economic levers, TFEL strategies, have been deployed to different ends. But in each case, the aim is to achieve tactical or strategic advantage over an adversary, which until more recently has most commonly been state rather than non-state actors. This annex provides examples of these applications of TFEL to provide the reader with some perspective on what the Ministry of Defence, MOD, could seek to achieve by developing a standing capability. Blockades, embargoes and sanctions In its simplest form, blockades, embargoes and sanctions are types of economic pressure that seek to deny, disrupt and disable an adversary's economic capability. They reduce an adversary's access to resources in an attempt to either coerce a change of behaviour or force submission. One of the earliest examples of such economic pressure is the Megarian Degree, issued by the Athenian Empire in 432 BC. This decree banned the Megarians from harbours and marketplaces throughout the large Athenian Empire, thus strangling the Megarian economy. A further example from history is the palpable excommunication of England in 1570, through which the Catholic Church sought to punish England for crowning a Protestant, and thus heretic, as Queen by isolating England from trade with the rest of Catholic Europe. This example also provides an early lesson on the effective use of economic levers, as well as the possible unintended consequences that should be considered. Freed from the Catholic Church's embargo on trading with non-Catholic nations, England was able to expand its trading relations with powerful counterparts such as the Ottoman Empire, which granted England preferential trading rights superior to any offered to other European trading nations. Footnote 63 Jardine Lisa, Gloriana Rules the Waves, or The Advantage of Being Excommunicated and a Woman. Transactions of the Royal Historical Society, 2004, page 211. Footnote 64, same as previous source, page 210. Return to main text. Such economic coercion is often employed in conflict. History is peppered with examples of economic embargoes and blockades 
being imposed in both civil and regional wars. For example, during the American Civil War, the Union blockaded the Confederate ports with the aim of both preventing the imports of armaments and weaponry into the southern states and halting the exports of cotton from the plantations, which were known as the South's coin of the realm because of the vital role they played in southern exports and thereby its economy. Footnote 65. Still junior, William N. A naval sieve, the Union blockade in the Civil War. Naval War College, May to June 1983. Page 38. Return to main text. During World War I, Allied forces employed a blockade of Germany with the simple aim of starving Germany into surrender by applying economic pressure to both harm the public's morale at home and to reduce the availability of supplies required to sustain the war. Within a week of the outbreak of war, the German merchant fleet had been banished from the oceans. Footnote 66 Kramer Allen Blockade and Economic Warfare The Cambridge History of the First World War, Volume 2, The State 2014, page 465 Return to Main Text In addition, the blockade also affected trade between Germany and neutral states. Footnote 67 Same as previous source, page 467 Return to main text. While the blockade's effectiveness depended on the ingenuity of neutral shippers and the resolve of the Allies to apply pressure on the neutrals, by 1918, Germany's imports fell to less than 39% of their pre-war value and only one-fifth of their pre-war volume. Footnote 68. Same as previous source, page 477. Return to main text. Exports also fell to about 25% of their pre-war level, due to both the blockade and the fact that Germany was at war with half of its trading partners. In more recent times, the international community, either unanimously via the United Nations Security Council or on a regional basis amongst like-minded nations, have used financial sanctions as a means of seeking to encourage behavioural change by nations, restrict the operations of terrorist groups, and disrupt the activities of organised crime groups, kleptocrats and human rights abusers. The sanctions imposed against Russia by the United States and the European Union following the annexation of Crimea and the further violation of Ukrainian sovereignty in 2014 are a case in point. Russian Violation of Ukraine Sovereignty, 2014 Sanctions against Russia were imposed by the US and the European Union in reaction to Russia's violation of Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity starting in March 2014. Footnote 69 Bazubandi, Sarah et al. On Target EU Sanctions as Security Policy Tools European Union Institute for Security Studies, 2015, page 39. Return to main text. One aim of the sanctions imposed against Russia was to halt a further escalation of the conflict and freeze the conflict along the post-Minsk demarcation line. In addition, the sanction made the integration of Crimea more expensive for Russia. It can be argued that as a result of the sanctions regime, the Ukrainian state survived. Footnote 70. Same as previous source. Page 41. Return to main text. Previous sanctions have included the following. Asset freezes and travel bans on individuals and entities that have been involved in or benefited from Russia's actions in Ukraine and individuals that were identified to be responsible for the misappropriation of Ukrainian state funds included are Russian politicians, members of the Russian armed services, separatist leaders in eastern Ukraine, officials Russia appointed to the government in Russian-occupied Crimea, and some of President Vladimir Putin's close business associates. 
Restrictions on transacting with and investing in Russian-occupied Crimea businesses. Sectoral sanctions targeting the oil and gas, defence and financial sectors in Russia. An arms embargo. Restrictions on economic cooperation between Western development banks and Russia. Footnote 71. Harel Peter E. et al. The Future of Transatlantic Sanctions of Russia. Center for a New American Security, 15th of June, 2017, page 2. Return to main text. Sanctions imposed by the European Union must be unanimously agreed every 6 to 12 months by the member states. In contrast, sanctions imposed by the US remain in effect unless they are lifted. Footnote 72. Same as previous source. Page 3. Return to main text. For Russia, the sanctions regime meant, according to International Monetary Fund calculations, a decrease in its gross domestic product, GDP, growth rate of between 1% and 1.5%. Footnote 73. Same as previous source. Page 3. Return to main text. More importantly, Companies associated with the sanctions regime have lost about one-third of their operating revenue, over half their asset value, and about one-third of their employees. In addition, it can be argued that sanctions against Russia led to a slowing of the modernisation efforts of the Russian military. Footnote 74. Same as previous source. Page 4. Return to main text. It can also be argued that the sanctions regime implemented by the US and the European Union was a success, given the fact that Russia has not seized more Ukrainian territory since 2014 or engaged in further destabilising activities in Ukraine. However, overall, the foreign policy of Russia has remained interventionist. Footnote 75. Same as previous source. Page 1. Return to main text. The success of such economic pressure, applied on a standalone basis and without international consensus, is far from assured. An example would be the ongoing embargo placed on Qatar by other members of the Gulf Cooperation Council in 2017, where Qatar has secured alternative supplies of food and consumer goods, financed by the continued demand around the world for supply from its vast gas reserves. Footnote 76. Matt Smith, BBC News. How is Qatar coping with its economic embargo? 10th of January 2019. Return to main text. Financing friendship and alliances. Economic levers can include providing overt or covert economic support, ranging from signing trade deals on favourable terms, through to providing financing and resources to proxies waging an insurgency against a foe. The former is currently most evident in the form of China's Belt and Road Initiative as it deploys its national wealth to extend its strategic influence to develop client states in parts of the world that have previously been more allied with Western powers. As China binds an increasing number of countries with economic ties, this poses a direct threat to the UK and allies in the West. China's Belt and Road Initiative In 2013, China launched its Belt and Road Initiative. The project links China with the Persian Gulf and the Mediterranean Sea through Central and West Asia and connects China with Southeast Asia, South Asia and the Indian Ocean by land and sea. Footnote 77. Sogopolis George, N. Greece, Israel and China's Belt and Road Initiative, Mideast Security and Policy Studies, number 139, October 2017, page 7 F. Return to main text. This area covers 55% of world's GDP, 70% of global population, and 75% of known energy reserves. Footnote 78. Bondas Antoine, One Belt, One Road, 
China's Great Leap Outward, European Council on Foreign Relations, 2015, page 1. Return to main text. The initiative, which intertwines political and economic interest, has two components. The Silk Road Economic Belt, which aims to facilitate land-based trade across the Eurasian landmass, and the 21st century Maritime Silk Road. Footnote 79. Same as previous source. Page 3. Return to main text. The Washington Institute noted in 2011 that port building, as part of the 21st century Maritime Silk Road initiative, had three dimensions. Obtaining access to airfields and ports by gaining access to or building new facilities globally, with the understanding that they will be available when needed. Increasing diplomatic relations to ensure that shipping lanes remain clear and trade agreements are in place. And modernising China's military to hold individual pearls of capability when necessary. Footnote 80. Nowen's Vila, China's 21st Century Maritime Silk Road, Implications for the UK. RUSI Occasional Papers, February 2019, page 26. Return to main text. The ambition of the Chinese Navy is further outlined in the 2015 Defence White Paper stating that China's armed forces would be used to safeguard the security of China's overseas interests, which include energy and resources, strategic sea lines of communication, as well as institution, personnel and assets abroad. Footnote 81. Same as previous source. Page 26. Return to main text. In 2017, Chinese state-owned companies announced plans to buy or secure majority stakes in nine overseas ports, all located in regions where China plans to develop new sea lanes. This is in addition to the 40 ports in Africa, Asia and Europe, in which Chinese state-owned firms hold stakes worth in excess of US $40 billion. Port locations are chosen as part of China's wider strategic effort to redirect shipping routes and play a stronger role in international shipping, and to increase trade via Chinese-built and operated container ports. Footnote 82. Same as previous source, page 5. Return to main text. China's return on investment from increased port access and supply chains is not all about economics. In five cases, Djibouti, Walvis Bay, Namibia, Gudar, Pakistan, Hambantota, Sri Lanka and Piraeus, Greece, China's port investments have been followed by regular People's Liberation Army and Navy deployments and strengthened military agreements. In this way, financial investments have been turned into geostrategic returns. Footnote 83 Kinj James et al., Financial Times, Beijing's Global Power Play, How China Rules the Waves, 12th of January, 2017. Return to main text. China's increasing willingness to use its grown economic muscle to achieve strategic objectives or exert tactical pressure can be seen from a series of actions it has taken over the past 10 years, as shown in Table A.1. These actions have been carefully designed to demonstrate its economic might and to challenge all nation-states, but notably targeted against the US. Table 8.1 Chinese Economic Actions Year 2010 Action China reduced its salmon purchases from Norway, home of the Nobel Committee, upon award of the Nobel Peace Prize to Chinese dissident Liu Xiaobo. 2014. China curtails the import of Japanese automobiles to signal its displeasure of security policies published by Japan. China expresses a desire to increase trade with South Korea should it reject the local deployment of a US missile defence system. 2014 to 2015. China ports block the import of bananas from the Philippines 
due to public statements opposing China's policies in the South China Sea. 2016 China is the driving force behind creating the Asia Investment Bank as direct regional competitor to the Washington-based World Bank. 2019 China ceased pork and canola imports from Canada shortly after the arrest of the Hawaii Chief Financial Officer. 2019 Ongoing US-China Trade Conflict Whilst Russia lacks the resources of China, it is likewise adept at employing economic levers to destabilise countries, develop client-state relationships and threaten Western interests. Russia's activities in Libya are a case in point. Russia's strategic involvement in Libya Russia's interest in Libya has a long history and two primary reasons continue to guide Russia's foreign policy towards Libya today. The geostrategic position of Libya and access to energy resources. Footnote 84 Boshkevskaya Anna, The Washington Institute Russia's growing interest in Libya 24th of January 2020. Return to main text. Libya still has the largest oil reserves in Africa and was, prior to 2011, the third largest oil exporter to Europe. Footnote 85. Foya Serra et al. Libya, a violent theatre of regional rivals. INSS Insight, July 2019, page 2. Return to main text. In 1945, during the Potsdam Conference, Joseph Stalin unsuccessfully tried to claim trusteeship over Libya's Tripolitania province. During the Cold War, Libya became an important arms client for the Soviet Union, and in 2011, after the North Atlantic Treaty Organization's NATO intervention in Libya, the then Russian Prime Minister Putin condemned the international support for the intervention as a medieval call for crusaders. He specifically accused the US and NATO of cynically manipulating the international system to impose regime change in Libya. However, the main reason for the strong Kremlin reaction was the loss of political influence and multi-billion dollar industrial contracts in Libya. Footnote 86 Boygiova Natalia How We Got Here With Russia, The Kremlin's World View Institute for the Study of War, March 2019, page 19. Return to main text. The value to Russia of a strong, long-term position in Libya is clear. It would gain leverage over European energy supplies and be in a strategic position from which to gain further access to the Middle East and Africa. Libya's deep water ports of Tobruk and Dana would be very useful for the Russian Navy, not only logistically, but particularly geostrategically, especially in combination with its existing use of the Syrian port of Tartus. Footnote 87. Boshkevkaya, Anna, The Washington Institute, Russia's Growing Interest in Libya, 24th of January 2020. Return to main text. However, since the toppling of the Gaddafi regime in 2011, Not only Russia, but also many other countries, in and beyond the region, saw the ensuing chaos as an opportunity to promote their own geostrategic and economic interests. Even implementing the Libyan political agreement in December 2015, which formally marked the end of the First Civil War and created the internationally recognised government of accord in Tripoli, could not end the inner political conflicts nor the continuous intervention of foreign regional and supra-regional states in Libya. Footnote 88 Foyacera et al. Libya, a violent theatre of regional rivals. INSS Insight, July 2019, page 1. Return to main text. Since 2014, the Russian policy towards Libya can be described as maximum return on minimal investment. Footnote 89, Medjurisi Turek, Libya's Global Civil War, 
European Council on Foreign Relations, June 2019, page 10. Return to main text. Russia has spoken to all conflict parties in Libya, albeit to some more than others. In 2015, the preferred Russian partner, Field Marshal Hafter, started to reach out to Moscow for support. He offered what Russia was looking for, energy deals and port access. Footnote 90, Borshkevskaya, Anna, The Washington Institute, Russia's Growing Interest in Libya, 24th of January 2020. Return to main text. Haftar promised to renew the Russian contracts with Gaddafi, which were worth US $9 to $10 billion. However, given the destruction of Libya during the civil war, they could now be worth even more. Footnote 91. Sulinmanov Emil Aslan, the Middle East Policy Council, Russia's policy in the Libyan civil war, a cautious engagement, summer 2019. Return to main text. Consequently, Russia began to provide military advice and diplomatic support at the United Nations to Haftar and started to print Haftar's own currency. In 2017, Russia provided medical support to Haftar's soldiers in Russia and increased the number of military trainers and shadowy private military companies in Libya to protect oil assets. Footnote 92, Borshkevskaya, Anna, The Washington Institute, Russia's growing interest in Libya, 24th of January, 2020. Return to main text. Russia has concurrently maintained its ties with the government of national accord, mainly oil agreements, which reflects Russia's awareness that either Haftar may be unsuccessful or that an exclusive relationship with Haftar would limit future options. Footnote 93. Megarisi Tarek, Libya's Global Civil War, European Council on Foreign Relations, June 2019, page 10. Return to main text. Thus, Russia has positioned itself as a critical arbiter of peace between the country's competing factions. Libya, on the other hand, has empowered Russia's negotiating hand against the West, not least since the standoff and instability in Libya could allow Russia to use mass migration from Libya as leverage against Europe. Footnote 94. Aladdin Ranj. Shaping the Political Order of the Middle East, Crisis and Opportunity, Instituto Afari Internazionale, IAI, Papers 19, 9th of April 2019, page 7. Return to main text. A Russian dialogue over Libya with Europe, exploiting the European Union's concerns over migration, could lead to an expanding rift within the European Union, over their approach to Russia. Footnote 95. Sulinmanov Emil Aslan, the Middle East Policy Council, Russia's policy in the Libyan civil war, a cautious engagement, summer 2019. Return to main text. In addition, indirect control over Libya's energy resources, achieved through a friendly and indebted government, may increase Russia's role in Mediterranean politics and security and could turn Russia, apart from tangible economic interests, into an important actor with a say in conventional security and energy policy. Footnote 96. Same as previous source. Return to main text. The Russian commitment in Libya is also important for the relationship between Russia and key regional players. The relationship between Russia and Egypt improved and deepened over Russia's commitment to Libya, given that Egypt most likely persuaded Russia to support Haftar as well as their relationship with the United Arab Emirates. Russia may also use its new position in the region as additional leverage over Turkey. Footnote 97. Same as previous source. Return to main text. In short, at the moment, Moscow benefits from simply staying put in Libya while maintaining its influence, especially through Russian private military companies funded through opaque mechanisms and networks. 
Footnote 98. Same as previous source. Return to main text. Providing financing and resources, for example weapons, to proxies is a popular way of supporting insurgencies that are fighting against adversary nations. As the next two case studies illustrate, this is a method that can be employed by the UK and allied nations, as with the US funding of the Mujahideen in their conflict with the Soviet Union in Afghanistan, but can also be used against the UK to attack the homeland and its assets around the world, as evidenced by Libyan leader Muammar Gaddafi's financing and resourcing of the Provisional Irish Republican Army, IRA. Finance in theatre. The case studies noted thus far have typically involved remote engagement, using blockades, imposing financial sanctions and providing funding and resources to proxies. But in recent years, finance has been used as a central tool by the UK and allied forces in theatres of operation. In operations conducted against Islamic State across Syria and Iraq, Targeting the group's sources of funding, particularly the region's oil infrastructure and cash storage facilities, was central to the coalition's response on the basis that Islamic State's ambition to take, hold and control territory would require extensive funding. Identifying and then destroying these sources of income would restrict the group's ability to operate. United States bombing of Islamic State oil fields after much hesitation and reluctance, in late 2015, the US Air Force was given the green light by the Obama administration to escalate its airstrikes on Islamic State-controlled oil fields in Syria to cut off ISIS's main source of revenue. The US Treasury Department estimated the revenue that Islamic State was receiving to be approximately US $40 million per month. Footnote 99 Crane Keith, The Role of Oil in ISIL Finances, Rand Cooperation Testimony, December 2015, page 3. Return to Main Text. Operation Tidal Wave 2 was revealed and launched in October 2015 and involved bombing a selection of eight oil fields alongside two thirds of the oil refineries in the region. Areas or sites that were difficult to repair once damaged, or those that required special equipment from foreign countries to repair, were targeted. This also included destroying parts of pumping stations and fuel oil separators. On 21st of October, US B-1 bombers hit 26 targets in Omar oil field, the largest of the eight oil fields targeted. Simultaneously, France also continued its campaign of attacks on the region's oil fields, having been victim of multiple terrorist attacks that same year, with one attack killing over 100 people. Footnote 100. Thompson Mark, Time. US bombing of ISIS oil facilities showing progress. 13th of December, 2015. Return to main text. Oil was a lucrative financial lifeline for Islamic State militants, largely due to its market value and its strategic value in sustaining a war. Due to the latter reason, it is alleged that even ISIS's enemies, such as the Syrian Arab army, were among its customers for oil, as it was equally needed by opposing armies to power their own military activity. ISIS gained a financial reward in doing so, and that was likely considered to be of higher strategic value than foregoing the cash, even though the former option also advantaged its enemy. Footnote 101. Crane Keith, The Role of Oil in ISIL Finances, Rand Cooperation Testimony, December 2015, page 4F. Return to Main Text. By May 2016, Islamic State had lost a third of its territorial gains in Iraq and Syria. Three years later, in March 2019, Islamic State lost its final shred of territory in Baghouz, Syria, after they surrendered it to the Syrian Democratic Forces. Today, Islamic State has been defeated territorially, 
denying them the ability to make economic gains from the territory they once held. But due to their fragmented nature as a non-state actor, whilst their funding needs are considerably diminished, their ideology and threat to the West persists, as evidenced by the 2020 US $1 billion seizure in Italy of amphetamines produced by Daesh for the European market. Footnote 102 Guy Jack et al. CNN Italian police seize over $1 billion of ISIS-made Captagon amphetamines. 1st of July, 2020 Return to main text The techniques used to counter-threat finance need not be kinetic. Indeed, most often, an understanding of threat finance plays an important role in supporting the development of the broader intelligence understanding of an adversary, its capabilities and networks. Exploiting financial intelligence Many insurgency theorists, military operators and intelligence officials have posited that financing insurgent groups is pivotal for sustaining their operations, and thus their financial system should be key targets in operations by counterinsurgents. Financial records of a militant group, if exploited in a timely manner, provide valuable intelligence on the group's command and control, funding and decision-making. Footnote 103. Barney Benjamin et al. An Economic Analysis of the Financial Records of Al-Qaeda in Iraq. Rand Cooperation, 2010, page 73. Return to main text. For example, an analysis of captured financial records that recorded the daily financial transactions of both specific sectors within Iraq's Anbar province and of Al-Qaeda in Iraq, AQI, provincial administration from 2005 and 2006, offer key insights into the organisation that did not exist previously. Key findings of this analysis included that AQI was based on a hierarchically organised system of financing and administration with established bureaucratic relationships and rules. Footnote 104. Same as previous source. Page 14. Return to main text. This meant that AQI relied on regular revenue sources to fund the operations and to pay salaries. The funding of AQI in Anbar was based to a large degree on theft and resell of high-value items such as generators and cars. Footnote 105. Same as previous source, page 14. Return to main text. The report indicates that every additional insurgent attack cost the group around US $2,700. Footnote 106. Same as previous source. Page 75. Return to main text. The analysis shows that AQI is highly sensitive to cash flows. Therefore, a disruption of the cash flow could lead to a reduction in the numbers of attacks the organisation can muster. Footnote 107. Same as previous source. Page 15. Return to main text. Annex B. UK departments and agencies with roles in threat finance. The activities of most bodies described in this annex are largely focused on domestic economic issues, but their roles in international threat finance are also highlighted. All will IAs to some extent with the international community, covering countries, businesses and individuals. The most senior bodies for directing threat finance issues at a time of national emergency or overseas military deployments are as follows. National Security Council slash National Security Secretariat. The National Security Council, NSC, is chaired by the Prime Minister and is the main forum for collective discussion of the UK government's objectives for national security and about how best to deliver them. Its key purpose is to ensure ministers consider national security in the round and in a strategic way. The National Security Secretariat, NSS, is led by the National Security Advisor, NSA, 
and supports the work of the NSC by providing policy advice based on guidance from government departments, the relevant National Strategic Intelligence Group, and the intelligence picture provided by the Joint Intelligence Organisation. National Strategic Intelligence Groups National Strategic Intelligence Groups, NSIGs, are cross-government bodies of senior officials that advise the NSA and NSC on the approach required for dealing with different threat areas. The economic crime threat to the UK is dealt with by the Serious Organised Crime, NSIG, and chaired by its senior responsible officer, currently the Director General of the Home Office, Serious Organised Crime Group. Economic Crime Strategy Board In July 2019, the government launched its first ever comprehensive Public-Private Economic Crime Plan, ECP. This established a cross-ministerial Public-Private Governance Board, the Economic Crime Strategic Board, ECSB. The board has representatives from major banks and other regulated sectors. It is mandated to oversee the delivery of actions covered in the plan's strategic priorities. Departments Other UK government agencies slash departments with roles to play in different aspects of international threat finance work include the following. Home Office The Home Office is the lead department for domestic security issues, including counter-terrorism, and provides the government lead for international crime policy. Its overseas agencies with enforcement powers, such as Border Force and Immigration Enforcement, have overseas staff in key jurisdictions. The Office for Security and Counterterrorism leads policy work on counterterrorism and the Serious Organised Crime Group is responsible for writing the UK's Serious and Organised Crime Strategy. It also has staff based overseas who help draft regional Serious and Organised Crime Joint Analysis reports known as SOCJAs. These summarise crime threats within regions, including the threat posed by economic crime. Her Majesty's Treasury Her Majesty's Treasury, HM Treasury, is responsible for implementing and administrating international financial sanctions in effect in the UK through the Office of Financial Sanctions Implementation, OFSI. HM Treasury jointly leads with the Home Office on the delivery of the Economic Crime Plan. They also licence exemptions to financial sanctions and impose domestic designations under the Terrorist Asset Freezing Act 2010. The Treasury publishes a consolidated list of financial sanctions targets listed by the United Nations, European Union and UK. It includes all individuals and entities noted on current sanctions lists. Responsibility for enforcing the financial sanctions imposed by HM Treasury falls to the National Crime Agency. The OFSI helps to ensure that financial sanctions are properly understood, implemented and enforced in the United Kingdom. The OFSI is also responsible for monitoring compliance with financial sanctions and for assessing suspected breaches. It undertakes civil enforcement itself, including issuing monetary penalties for breaches of financial sanctions and works with law enforcement agencies for investigation and potential prosecution. The OFSI takes action in every instance of reported non-compliance. HM Treasury's sanctions and illicit finance team aims to reduce the economic crime threat to the integrity and stability of the UK financial system and support national security objectives through financial sanctions, anti-money laundering, counter-terrorist and counter-proliferation finance measures. This includes using its representation at the Financial Action Task Force, FATF, and other international fora to strengthen international anti-money laundering and counter-terrorist financing standards. Membership of these bodies set standards and promote effective implementation of legal, regulatory and operational measures for combating money laundering, terrorist financing and other related threats to the integrity of the international financial system. 
Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office The Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, FCDO, has overall responsibility for the UK's policy on sanctions and embargoes and has a specific sanctions unit. The FCDO are responsible for the UK's overseas aid budget and the governance and security of its allocation. The department is also the home for the new International Centre of Excellence for Illicit Finance. The centre will bring together stakeholders, including the Ministry of Defence, with the aim of centralising the government's thinking on illicit finance. Financial Conduct Authority The Financial Conduct Authority is the conduct regulator for financial services firms and financial markets in the UK. This includes implementing, supervising and enforcing national and international standards and regulations in the UK. The authority has regular engagement with international counterparts and law enforcement agencies. Serious Fraud Office The Serious Fraud Office is a specialist prosecuting authority tackling the top level of serious or complex fraud, bribery and corruption. This can include assisting overseas jurisdictions with their investigations. Nearly all investigations have an international dimension and this is covered by the Proceeds of Crime and International Division. Bank of England The Bank of England's main roles include issuing banknotes, regulating banks, setting monetary policy and maintaining monetary and financial stability. It also operates key parts of the UK's financial critical national infrastructure, provides banking services to over 100 international central banks and stores gold bars, most of which are held on behalf of other countries. Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy and Department for International Trade The Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, BEIS, is the UK department responsible for trade sanctions, including bans on weapon exports and associated technology. The Department for International Trades, Export Control Joint Unit controls and licenses military and dual-use items. Law Enforcement Agencies Law enforcement bodies with roles to play in different aspects of international threat finance work include the following. National Crime Agency The National Crime Agency, NCA, was created in 2015 to lead the UK's activities against serious and organised crime. Its focus is at the national and international level, with other aspects of the threat being dealt with by regional organised crime units and individual police forces. The NCA's international department has about 150 international liaison officers based in 50 countries, all of whom will liaise on economic crime issues where necessary, their remit covers over 130 countries. Within the agency, there is the International Anti-Corruption Coordination Centre, IACCC, which brings together specialist law enforcement officers from multiple and international agencies to tackle allegations of grand corruption. The centre will improve fast-time intelligence sharing, assist countries that have suffered grand corruption and help bring corrupt elites to justice. It was launched in July 2017 and is hosted by the NCA until 2021 when it is anticipated that hosting will transfer to another participant country. Membership principally comprises Five Eyes agencies but also Singapore and Interpol with Germany and Switzerland having separate observer status. National Economic Crime Centre The National Economic Crime Centre, NECC, is part of the NCA, but with its own Director General. It is a multi-agency centre established to deliver a step change in the response to tackling economic crime by setting threat priorities to inform operational coordination between partners. It also facilitates the exchange of data and intelligence between the public and private sectors through the Joint Money Laundering Intelligence Team Specific teams within the NECC include the following. The Foreign Sanctions Team, 
coordinates UK law enforcement's responses to breaches of asset freezes imposed by the UK government in relation to those imposed on foreign regimes. Normally, these sanctions are part of a multilateral effort and enforce agreements reached at the United Nations or European Union level. The NECC is the principal law enforcement agency for enforcing breaches of financial sanctions in relation to those imposed against foreign regimes. The role of enforcing terrorist financing controls falls to partners such as national counter-terrorism units. The UK Financial Intelligence Unit, UK FIU, has national responsibility for receiving, analysing and disseminating financial intelligence submitted through the Suspicious Activity Reports, SAR, regime. The unit includes a terrorist finance team, which proactively analyses terrorist finance-related SAR and maintains relationships with relevant agencies and reporting sectors. The UK FIU also has an international team which services the unit's international obligations under the Financial Action Task Force requirements and those of similar international bodies. It is a single point of contact for UK law enforcement wanting to identify and trace assets abroad and for foreign law enforcement wanting to do the same for assets held in the UK. Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs, HMRC, are responsible for regulating taxes and other aspects of the financial sector in the UK. They also maintain an overseas network of fiscal crime liaison officers, including in most European countries, Panama, Melbourne, Beijing, Pretoria, Singapore and Accra. They are almost exclusively involved in fiscal fraud, but will cover for other agencies such as the NCA if there is not a presence in country. HMRC is also responsible for enforcing trade sanctions imposed by the BEIS. Metropolitan Police Service The Metropolitan Police provides the National Law Enforcement Lead for counter-terrorism investigations. The service's response includes the National Terrorist Financial Investigation Unit, NTIFU. Amongst its duties, the unit investigates the transfer of funds to support terrorism overseas and has liaison officers based within areas in defence. National Fraud Intelligence Bureau The National Fraud Intelligence Bureau, NFIB, is part of the City of London Police. It has no significant international function, but uses intelligence from fraud reporting to identify serial offenders, organised crime activity and emerging crime activity, all of which may connect to overseas jurisdictions of concern. Think Tanks and Policy Institutes Think tanks or policy institutes provide research and advocacy on topics such as social policy, political strategy, economics, military, technology and culture, which contribute to the deeper understanding of TFEL, best practice and emerging threats. Think tanks and institutions that contribute to economic thinking include the following. Transparency International Transparency International, TI, Defence and Security, is part of the global Transparency International movement dedicated to tackling corruption, strengthening transparency and accountability in the defence and security sector worldwide, and countering malicious actors in fragile environments. Armed forces are the first line of defence in protecting peace and stability, but militaries plagued with corruption can exacerbate conflict and fragility, can undermine efforts to provide security and can consume disproportionate levels of public funding. Royal United Services Institute Royal United Services Institute, RUSI, Centre for Financial Crime and Security Studies, is dedicated to addressing the challenges of financial crime and threat finance to the UK and international security, as well as identifying how finance can identify and disrupt a range of globally recognised threats. Chatham House Chatham House organises research expertise into a set of core programmes. 
some are focused on geographical area studies, and others on specific themes such as finance and security. Lexicon AFDL Alliance des Forts Démocratiques pour la Libération du Congo AJP Allied Joint Publication ANPR Automatic Number Plate Recognition AQI Al-Qaeda in Iraq BEIS Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy CARDS Conflict Analysis of Root Causes and Drivers CCTV Closed Circuit Television Colton Columbite Tantalites COVID-19 Coronavirus 2019 CTF Counter Threat Finance DCDC Development Concepts and Doctrine Centre DOD Department of Defence DRC Democratic Republic of the Congo ECP Economic Crime Plan ECSB Economic Crime Strategic Board FATF Financial Action Task Force FCDO Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office FININT Financial Intelligence GDP Gross Domestic Product HMRC Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs HM Treasury Her Majesty's Treasury IACCC International Anti-Corruption Coordination Centre IRA Irish Republican Army JDN Joint Doctrine Note JDP Joint Doctrine Publication JIEDAC Joint Improvised Explosive Device Analysis Centre JMLIT Joint Money Laundering Intelligence Task Force MCDC Multinational Capability Development Campaign MLC Mouvement de Libération du Congo MOD Ministry of Defence MONUC Mission de l'Organisation des Nations Unies en République démocratique du Congo MSE Military Strategic Effects NATO North Atlantic Treaty Organization NCA National Crime Agency NECC National Economic Crime Centre NFIB National Fraud Intelligence Bureau NTIFU National Terrorist Financial Investigation Unit NSA National Security Advisor NSC National Security Council NSIG National Strategic Intelligence Group NSS National Security Secretariat OFSI Office of Financial Sanctions Implementation ONUC Operation des Nations Unies au Congo PIFL Popular Islamic Front of Lonrovia RCD Goma Rassemblement Congolais pour la Démocratie Goma RUSI Royal United Services Institute SAR Suspicious Activity Report SO15 Counterterrorism Command slash Special Operations 15 SOCJAs Serious and Organised Crime Joint Analysis Reports SOCNet 
Serious and Organised Crime Network. TFEL Threat Finance and Economic Levers. TI Transparency International. UK United Kingdom. UK FIU UK Financial Intelligence Unit. UK Stratcom Strategic Command. US United States. VE Victory in Europe.